So uh, thank you very much. Thank you guys for organizing this. Fantastic. Uh, really excited to be here and to hear all the talks. Um, so yeah, so today I, I want to talk, to talk to you about recent advances in SNARGs. I'll explain what that is. And in particular, the focus is going to be on kind of how RAM SNARGs are effective in this area, and we'll talk about applications. So I'm, I'll explain what everything is. OK. So you know, uh, the world we live in is changing quite fast, uh, recently at least. Uh, so you know, we used to do our computations locally on our own devices. Uh, this was a while back. Uh, today, more and more of our computations uh, are done remotely. Uh, this is due to many reasons. Uh, for example, we have a lot of very weak computational devices, cell phones, uh, smartwatches. Uh, and not only computations, also there's a lot of data out there. And a lot of our data is stored uh, remotely. Uh, this is due, for, again, many reasons, but also partially due to uh, all the blockchain technology, where now you know all the transactions are stored in gigantic uh, public uh, ledgers. And to verify these transactions, whether it's payments or smart contracts, it's a huge computational burden. Okay, so it's done remotely. So now this kind of brings with it a whole new kind of uh, slew of challenges. Uh, well, there's economic challenges about incentives and so on, of course. So there's a lot of research going on in that regime. There's privacy challenges. You know, things are put in public ledgers or your data is stored elsewhere. You may want to be concerned about privacy. So of course, as a cryptographer, that's uh, very dear to my heart. Uh, but what I'm going to talk to you about today actually has to do with integrity. Okay, so not privacy. Rather, my question is, how do we know when we give, when we do our computations in some, on some untrusted platform, how do we know that the computation is done correctly? Okay, and this is the topic of today's talk. Okay, we want to verify that comp our computations that are done on untrusted remote servers or remote platforms are done correctly. Okay, so this is the motivation for studying this question. The question we want to efficiently verify correctness of computation. So let me define this a bit more formally. Let's say we want to have, we have some computation. Think of it as a Turing machine, a circuit, whatever computational model you want is com comfortable for you. So we have some computation M, for example, a Turing machine M. We have an input X. Now we want to be able to compute, the, do the computation, produce an output Y, and with it produce a succinct certificate that certifies the correctness of the output. Okay, and of course, crucially, this certificate should be kind of succinct, it should be efficient to verify it, and it should be hard to forge. Okay, so it's not easy to produce certificates for incorrect statements. So let me define this a bit more formally. So typically we have kind of completeness and soundness conditions. Completeness just says that if I indeed do the, let's say I do a time t computation, then I can generate a valid certificate, namely a certificate that will be accepted uh, for the output uh, in time not much more than t. I don't want to pay too much uh, to produce this certificate. And it should be uh, the certificate size and the time it takes to verify it should be much, much, much less than t. And that's, of course, paramount. I mean, it's very important. Otherwise, there's no point of doing all of this. OK, so I want to be, the certificate is very succinct and efficiently verifiable, much more, much faster than it takes to actually do the computation. OK, so this is the standard uh, completeness. By the way, feel free, please stop me with questions. I don't have an agenda to finish the talk or anything, so uh, uh, yeah. <clears throat> the second condition is that of soundness. So soundness means if an adversary tries to prove an invalid statement, so he's trying to prove that the output is Y, where it's not Y, it should be actually practically impossible for him to generate a valid certificate. Okay, so for incorrect statements, it's practically impossible to generate uh, a valid certificate. Now, what do I mean by practically impossible? What, what does that even mean? So what it means is, well, I don't want to say it's really, really impossible. I just say, you know what, maybe it's, you can do it, but it's going to be really hard computationally. In other words, what we show is if you can do it, if you can fake, then it means you can break really hard cryptographic assumptions. Like you can factor huge numbers and so on. 
Now, one can ask, why not just say it's impossible? What is this practically impossible? Why not just say, if it's incorrect, you should not be able. It's impossible to generate a succinct certificate, a valid certificate. The reason is, this is too much to ask for. Why? If incorrect statements do not have a succinct certificate, it means essentially, and, and if they do, they do have, if, if, if correct ones have succinct certificate, and incorrect ones do not have succinct certificates, it essentially means that any, let's say, time t, deterministic d time t computation, has a succinct certificate, meaning it's in n time, non-deterministic time, much, much smaller than t. And we believe that this is not the case. So by what we believe from complexity theory, we can't, this is too much to hope for. We need to kind of relax our soundness from statistical soundness to what we call computational soundness, okay? Which means basically false, like fake certificates are very hard to produce. So hard to produce that we believe adversaries do not have the power, the computational power, to produce them. Okay, any questions about, about this definition? Okay, so let me just mention one more thing. A again, in order to be able to construct these certificates, we also need to assume that the prover, the person generating the certificate, and the verifier, the pe person verifying the certificate, share some common random string. Okay, typically this common random string is often like a, some description of a hash function, for example. But it can be other, uh, something else as well. But you can think of it as some description for a hash function. And, uh, and the reason is, why do we need, where did I bring, all of a sudden I put like this common random string there. The reason is that without it, again you get kind of the same negative result. Essentially it's in this common random string that we embed our cryptographic assumption. Okay, so, so now we have, we assume we have a common random string. Again, for simplicity you can say, where does this come from? What do you mean common random string? We agree all of it on a hash function. I don't know, SHA-256, whatever. The, think of that as a good proxy for the random string. And now using this description of the hash, you know, we, you, I can generate a certificate and you can verify the certificate. This is our goal. Any questions about the goal? Okay, so now next you can ask, can we do it? Can we generate these, uh, 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 oh, one more thing. This is called, I'm gonna refer to it in the talk, and that was the title, a succinct, non-interactive, because it's just a certificate, non-interactive, argument. Argument as opposed to a proof, uh, namely computational sound, we call it argument, and short is a snarg. By the way, how many people have heard the buzzword snarg? Good, okay, wonderful. Okay, so that's our goal, to construct these snargs. Questions? Okay, so now first question is, do we have any such constructions of snargs? And the answer is, we actually have a lot. It's a really active area in cryptography. This is a subset. I just kind of, uh, you know, there's much more than this. Uh, this area is blooming. Uh, really beautiful theoretical ideas there. Also a lot of kind of uh, practical implementations. Actually, here are a few prototypes. Again, I'm sure there's many, many more. Uh, this is just a few that I found. And not only the, these things are implemented, they're actually deployed. Okay, and actually by, by many companies, again, once I, uh, recently Ethereum started uh, uh, using uh, these SNARGs uh, and there's many, many uh, more. So these things are, you know, are used. And now, you, the next question is, uh, are, are they sound? Can we prove soundness? And until recently, the answer was no, we actually couldn't. We use them, we deploy them, but actually proving so soundness under standard assumptions was not known. So what I would like to say is, oh, if someone can, can forge, then it means he can factor numbers or he can break other assumptions, learning with errors. I don't know, some assumptions that we believe. We couldn't say that until recently, okay? So <clears throat> then the pandemic happened, okay? And a lot of great things happened since. So let me tell you, so there's been a bunch of works. Now what do we know? First, great assumption, we can actually construct these SNARGs under very well studied assumptions. Learning with air, this is kind of our favorite post-quantum, what we believe is post-quantum secure uh, assumption, uh, decision linear, DDH and quadratic residues. These are our, I don't want to define these, but these are cryptographic assumptions that we as cryptographers believe very strongly that they're secure. 
These are standard assumptions. The succinctness we get, how big, how long is the certificate? Fantastic. The size of the certificate is a totally long t, the time it takes to, ver to do the computation. And we have other kind of benefits. We can update these snarks. I'm going to talk about, about, explain what I mean by updatable snarks. So a lot of great things uh, happen, but I think, in the essence, we have a much better understanding of this primitive. And this is what I'm hoping to convey in the talk. Questions? Okay. Okay, so let me tell you a little bit about the state of the art kind of pre-pandemic, okay, where, where we were. So this question actually already was studied and uh, defined actually in the work of uh, Kilian and Mikali uh, in the 90s, and they actually had great constructions. They could prove they can construct a snark for any d time t, even non-deterministic computations of size poly log t, exactly like the holy grail in a sense, but they were not under standard assumptions. What they, they could prove security under kind of what we call a random oracle model. This is an ideal model, it's not a real world model. Okay, so in some ideal model where there's a hash function and the adversary doesn't see the code of the hash function, he can just kind of uh, query it, send oracle queries, then they proved security. But this is not how we, <laughs> the hash functions are implemented today. You know, we use SHA-256 or actual hash functions. So in the real world, there was no proof of security, okay? But uh, this work was very influential. After this work, there was a lot of works trying to get rid of this kind of ideal assumption and construct these snarks under standard assumptions. And we, we couldn't do it for many years. We had various uh, relaxed models, uh, uh, designated verifiers that to, to check you needed some trap door that only certain verifiers had. Or we had pre-processing models where some gigantic pre-processing has happened. There were various models, I don't want to get into it, but we couldn't actually solve this question. Okay? Uh, by the way, I just want to say when I defined a SNARGs for deterministic computations, I did define it for non-deterministic, but non-deterministic is very, it's very similar. You just want to say that if you have a statement with a witness, you can take this witness and construct kind of a computational witness, a certificate, and you can think of it as a computational witness, which is much shorter. Okay, so that's kind of a snarg for the non-deterministic setting. Okay, so this is all we knew for a while. <clears throat> and then, together with Omer and Lisa Yang, who's my student, uh, in 2019, we showed how to actually construct these snarks under at least some complexity assumption, uh, some complexity assumptions on group uh, that have some bilinear maps. Again, I don't want to define the assumption, the assumption that we came up with, but it, it seems at least it's like standard looking, like a complexity type assumption, not an ideal model assumption. Uh, and the snarks we got is for any time t computation, but the snark was of size t to the epsilon. Okay, epsilon can be as small as you want. Okay, you can even make it slightly sub, sub constant, but think of it as t to the 0 0.001 or something. Okay, so it's not poly log but still much better than t, okay? It's still somewhat succinct. So we did it for det any deterministic time t computations. We also did it for RAM, the RAM model, and the RAM model is going to come up in the talk again and again. It's actually a very important model to study, uh, and it sheds a lot of understanding and a lot of light on this question. But in addition to increasing our understanding, the RAM model is actually very important just for constructing SNARGs. So what is this RAM? When I say uh, SNARGs for RAM time t, uh, what do I mean? I'm, I'm in a RAM computation, we think of the input as being huge, okay? And the verifier is not even given the input. He's giving only a hash of the input. So the, think of the input as huge. The verifier is giving some succinct hash, like a digest, if you want, of the input. And given the succinct digest, he should be able to verify that the computation and this gigantic input is correct. Okay, so this is kind of the RAM model. The RAM model, again, it's interesting where in the cases where even the input is huge. So you can't even read the, the statement in a sense. And the reason this is an important model, for example, in blockchains, which is today probably the most kind of uh, place that it's deployed the most, these snarks, indeed the input is huge. So actually the input is the ledger. It's a public ledger. And you hash it, uh, at least that's what these companies do, or, or at least Ethereum, I don't, I don't know exactly, I didn't look at what everyone does, but they hash the input, 
And now they want to prove that like transactions are valid. This is, uh, they give certificate for the validity of these, the dollar dollar stands for some transaction. Uh, and of course, the verifier can't even read the input. He doesn't, he doesn't hold the ledger. Okay, so he only has some hash. So this uh, RAM snar the snarks for RAM computation is just a, uh, very well motivated as its, as its own task, as its own kind of uh, primitive. Okay, and we also managed to do it for sub, sub, some subclasses of NP. Uh, for example, NTISP, which is uh, a non-deterministic kind of time T space S computations. Uh, the uh, parameters here are not important. I don't want to get into them really. The point is, we still don't have for NP. Okay, you can ask, do we have SNARG under standard assumptions with some kind of succinctness for NP? No, this is still not known. Okay, this was, but, okay, so this was the say, state kind of uh, pre-pandemic. Any questions about anything so far? You're a very quiet audience. You don't seem that entertained. Maybe I should sing. Uh, <laughs> okay, uh, so now I want to talk about what is the state of the art today, okay? Where are we now? So now, situation is much better. So first of all, we have all these results where instead of running the certificate being of size t to the epsilon, it's of size poly log t. So matches kind of the Killian Mikali random oracle model uh, assumptions. So this is great. Moreover, we have it under a bunch of standard assumptions. We don't need this complexity assumptions over by linear groups. We have it under LWE. We have, this is post-quantum. So now, for example, we have SNOGs that we believe are post-quantum secure, uh, LWE, standard assumption, uh, decision linear, quadratic residues, and uh, DDH. So again, for those who are not crypto experts here, it doesn't matter. We have it under a slew of standard cryptographic assumptions. Okay? Moreover, we know how to construct SNARGs that are updatable. Okay? I'll, I'll define this in a bit, but essentially what it means that I can take a SNARG of some computation and then kind of continue the computation and I can kind of update the SNARG accordingly. So I can kind of update it as I go along. And I'll talk about some applications of this in a bit. So, uh, so this is what we know. I just want to mention the updatable SNARG we also knew in uh, 2020, again under a, a size t to the epsilon. So it's kind of interesting. Before we had, under any kind of complexity assumption, we needed to pay this t to the epsilon. There was all these techniques required some recursion that killed the, succinct, the, like the full succinctness. And now, kind of by having a better understanding and using kind of more sophisticated techniques, we can get everything down to polylog. Okay, and again, a bunch of standard assumptions. Yes, then, thank you. In the RAM model, um, the, the T stands for the size of the unit? No, good, 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 great question. So the great question, Toda, thank you. Uh, so f uh, the question was for the RAM computation model, what is T? Is T just the huge input? Or what, what exactly is T? And the answer is, T is actually the runtime of the RAM program. So T can be much, much smaller than the actual input, which can be gigantic. And in the RAM, RAM model, what we want is the honest prover will run in time polynomial in the RAM time. So we want to preserve kind of the time of the honest prover. So in other words, if I have a gigantic public ledger, I'm some server, and I just want to do a computation that touches a few locations, I don't want to now generate a certificate that takes me time like the huge public ledger. I want the certificate to depend on the time it takes to do the RAM computation. And these achieve this kind of efficiency. Thanks. Any, any other questions? Okay. Uh, great. <clears throat> okay. So now I want to kind of show you how we go from this T to the epsilon to polylog T and how we get much better kind of assumptions. Okay. And it started from this. And again, the point is also to kind of have a clearer picture of what's going on before I think we were a bit clouded. Uh, okay. So the first observation uh, by a bunch of works was that actually to get all these constructions, what we need is what is called a barg. What is a barg? Let me explain. So everything to do uh, D time T, RAM T, this NTISP, whatever it is, all we need is a barg. What is a barg? A barg is a snarg for batch NP. Okay, so what is batch NP? I have, think of, let's say, K NP statements. NP, think of SAT, three coloring, whatever. I have some KNP statements, 
and witnesses. And I want to convince you that they're all in the language. Now I can send you all the witnesses. That will convince, you can check. But it's big, it's a size K times one witness, right? It's K witnesses. I want to do it succinctly. And it's a succinct kind of uh, a certificate. Okay? So in particular, the certificate should be much smaller than one witness times K. Yeah? Okay. What is the goal of a bar? How succinct do we want it to be? So the goal of a bar uh, is to get succinctness down to the length of one witness. That's kind of our goal. Now you can say, why, why stop there? Ask for a bar graph even smaller. Why not polylog, you know, some uh, tiny uh, certificate? And the answer is, yeah, that would be great. We all strive for that. But it would imply in particular a snark for NP. Because you can take a bar with just one NP statement, and if you can generate kind of a certificate that's much less than a witness, then it's a snark for NP. And yes, th that is our holy grail. We want to get there. But currently, it's still we're out of reach. OK? So uh, that would be amazing. Uh, we're not there yet. So let's try to at least take a bunch of statements and get a certificate that kind of, it's kind of K for the price of one. OK? That's kind of an intermediate goal. And it turns out that if we get this, then we get snarks for T, for like deterministic time, for RAM, for a lot of other things. So now, I, I'm going to explain to you a little bit how this is done. But before I go to the explanation, you can think, wait, why is a bar, why batch NP, why does it give, <clears throat> you know, why does it give like any time t, any deterministic time t? It's a bit odd. But so let me show you for d time t. I'm not going to show, actually, during the talk, we'll also get into RAM, why it implies RAM. But what is the idea? What is a d time t computation? Any, think of when you do a computation. When you want to prove that you did the computation correctly, it's just a bunch, of, to check that you did it correctly, it's a bunch of kind of local consistency check, checks. Say, so, okay, yeah, this did you did correctly, and this you did correctly, and this you did correctly, and then, and, then, and, then. It's like a, a batch. Everything you did correctly, this you did, and this you did, and this you did, and this you did. It's, there's some, it smells a little bit like a batch problem, uh, or a conjunction problem. And this is exactly kind of where, how barks come into the play. Okay, I'll come into play. So here's, let me, I'll show you how exactly, what is the snark for d time t, what it looks like if I have a bar. Okay, so this is the construction. Here's my snark for, d, for a deterministic time t computation. I'm going to do, first I'm going to write all the, let's think of a Turing machine model. First I'm going to write all the configurations for the Turing machine. I'm going to just do all the computation. Okay, that's the first thing. And then I'm going to hash it down. Okay, and the point is that the, the hash I'm going to use is one that has what's called a succinct local opening. What this means is that I can then open, I can check, I can ask, there's a way to open, like a configuration one, I can give an opening, and I can verify efficiently, succinctly, that indeed the hash is for this configuration one, or any configuration i. Okay, so when I say hash, the, what you should think of is it's kind of committing, it's computationally binding. Of course, it can be statistically binding because pigeonhole principle. Okay, I'm taking a huge thing and I'm generating a succinct hash. But I want it to be computationally binding. So I can, there's only one way of opening each bit or in this case, think of opening each configuration, each kind of a, a slot that has a configuration in it. Okay, so it should be, and, and what I want from this hash is that it can do a local opening. An example of that is Merkle hash, for those who are familiar. How many people know what Merkle hash is? Great. OK. So I'm going to hash it down. Now, I can't verify. OK, the hash is, nobody can verify. OK, nobody knows what's in there. It's just a hash. So what I add to it is a barg. What will the barg say? It will say that for any i between 1 to t, the two adjacent configurations, i minus 1 and i, are consistent. So the two configurations that I hashed are consistent. In other words, what I'm going to put in the bar, I'm going to show that there exists configuration i minus 1, configuration i, and valid openings. Okay, so these are the witness. The witness is going to be two configurations and two openings uh, that are consistent. So the openings are valid, and the configurations, indeed, you go from i minus 1 to i in the Turing machine. That's it. So that's how you use bar. <clears throat> now, I, I, I cheat a little bit. So first of all, I said it's the, that the barg is the size of one witness. Here, one witness is one configuration. 
configuration can be big, it's not poly log t. So there's a way to make these configurations small using more hashes. So this is actually a good snark for poly log space computations. Okay, but you can think of it also as kind of verifying not the entire thing together, but kind of little by little. So the actual construction is a bit more complicated, but this I think gives kind of the main idea of the construction. But more importantly is the soundness actually, which I want to spend a little bit, uh, say a few words about. Actually to prove that this is indeed sound, computationally sound, we need to make some assumptions, some additional assumptions about the hash and about the bug. And these assumptions have to do with extractability. So what we need is that the hash, on the one hand, it's succinct. So of course it's not statistically binding. But we do want to assume that it is statistically binding on a small part. Let's say one configuration. So there's one configuration that is statistically binding on. And using some trapdoor or some secret thing, you can actually extract. You can actually see what, what, uh, what it's statistically binding. So you can extract one configuration, some configuration i, let's say location i. Which location it's statistically binding on is secret. From the description of the hash, you have no idea where the hash is statistically binding on. And similarly for the barg, there is one witness that you can extract from the barg. Which witness you can extract? That's hidden in the description of the CRS. Okay, but it's important that both the hash and the barg are extractable, given some trapdoor, in one location. And the reason this is important, how will we prove soundness, computational soundness? The way I want, I'm going to prove kind of by induction, that if you're accepted, all the configurations you put there, like in sense, have to be the correct one. And the way we're going to prove it is going to, I'm going to say, you know what, let me be here statistically binding, oh, I'm not supposed to move, sorry, camera, uh, statistically binding on the first configuration, and I'm going to extract the first witness. And now, what does the bar say? That the first witness, the first witness, which is configuration zero and configuration one, are consistent. And namely consistent with the input and so on. And they have to be, configuration one is binding on. So you can't open two different, you have to open to the configuration one that it's binding on. So it must be the correct one. And now, and kind of you prove kind of inductively, every time you kind of move where you're statistically binding on, like from the first to the second to the third, and every time you, do, you assume by induction that when you open the one before, it must be the correct one. Because we already proved by induction. And then you kind of, so it's important that you are able to extract. Now, of course, you can't extract everything because it's succinct, so we just extract one. And every time we move kind of the one that we extract. Okay, so this was very, very high level. I don't expect you to really understand the proof of, of the soundness, but I want to emphasize that there's some extractability going on because we'll see it again and again. Yes? Good. So, the, okay, it's, it's a bit subtle. So the question is, why do we need the extractability of the barg? The reason we need the extractability of the barg is to break the soundness of the, so, okay, is, I'm going to show that if you're a cheater, then I can use you to break the binding property of the hash. And the way I'm going to do I'm going to extract an opening. And this opening, because I, I have a witness, but this opening will be for the wrong thing. And then I, because I, I know that the configuration that over there is correct, and then I'm going to use the opening to argue, oh, you opened in two different ways. So it's, it's a bit subtle, but uh, uh, yeah, great. Any, any other questions? Okay, so, but the truth is if you didn't follow this argument, it's not so important. What I want to emphasize is Barg is kind of the new kid in the block, okay? We understood actually Barg implies everything. I showed you here a sketch for why it implies D times T, but actually it implies all the snarks we know and, uh, that we knew before under any kind of complexity assumptions. So now we know all we need is to construct these bargs. This is the new kid in the block, and we want to construct it. Okay, so can we construct it? Oh, sorry, before, one more thing I want to mention, uh, because this again, it's uh, the parameters, but it will come up again and again, is that, you know, I said the bargain implies snark, but what about the parameters? So a bar can be very succinct, can be not so succinct. So here's the thing. <clears throat> if the bar is of size, let's say, one witness times poly log, you will imply a, a snark for size. So if the bar is times, it depends polylogarithmic on k, the snark will depend polylogarithmic on t. 
More generally, if this is of size L of k, L can be, I don't know, k to the epsilon or whatever, we'll get L of t. And the reason is we're barking here t statements. So we'll grow with, you know, with a bark on t. Okay? Great. Okay. So, so now, okay, so great, we showed the bargs, but we have bargs. And this was kind of a really, really beautiful result from 2001 uh, by Chuduri, Jane, and Jin that showed we actually have bargs from learning with error. Again, this is our favorite kind of post-quantum uh, assumption in cryptography of really kind of the best uh, succinctness we could hope for. So this was wonderful. And uh, so, you know, we all got excited. And let me say, uh, <clears throat> there's also other constructions actually predating this. A, bit, a couple months before this, these three authors put another paper uh, where they also constructed a barg, but we were not that excited because that barg was of size square root k. Meh, you know, not great. So it'll give you a snark of size square root t. Okay. It was under quadratic residue in DDH. Uh, and after this result, now everybody's trying to get better and better bargs because we understand that's the best, you know, if we get that, we have everything. And there was another paper that got uh, from decision linear assumption, which is, a, again, an assumption that we, um, you know, it's a very standard assumption in cryptography with uh, uh, succinctness k to the epsilon. So that will give a snarg of size t to the epsilon, where t is the time. Okay, so a <clears throat> any questions? Okay, so again, this gives you a snarg of square root t and a snarg of, of t to the epsilon. Okay, so what do I want to focus on for the rest of, of the talk today? So what I want to show you is actually, even if you construct a very long barg, we can get, I can boost you all the way to like super succinct barg. So really, in order to construct a snarg, all I need you to construct a barg slightly shorter than k times a single witness. So again, k times a single witness is trivial. You just give all the witnesses. Anything a little bit better than that, that's all I need. <clears throat> okay, so let me tell you a little bit uh, more details. Even if you construct a snarg of size, a single witness, times k to the 1 minus epsilon, epsilon could be as small as you want, any constant. Actually, we can get much better than that. We can get k to the 1 minus little o of 1. But I don't want to get into the exact parameters. Then, <clears throat> first thing we show, you can get from that a snarg of size one witness times polylog, which is kind of, that will give us the snarg we want. Okay, and this is a joint work with Alex Lombardi, Vinod de Kuntanathan, and Daniel Wicks. And then we also show in a different work that if you have a, a barg with polylog multiplicative overhead, we can actually get a bar of really like one witness plus a polylog overhead. So what's called rate one bar. Okay, and this is joint work with Lali Devadas, who's our student, uh, Rishab Goyal and Vinod. Uh, and this is what I'm gonna focus on for the rest of the talk, these two results. Great, great. So the, I love your questions. Uh, guys, this is nice, so you should help. Uh, a lot of pressure on, on you. Wh what's your name? Kedem. Kedem. Uh, yeah, so how does the question, it's a great question. Okay, why do I care so much about the W plus? What, how does it translate to a snark? What does it give me? And the answer is, for one snark, what does it translate to? I can't really tell you. But this is what gives you the updatability. It actually gives you very interesting uh, corollary that I'll explain next. Okay, so I'll explain what, what, it, what, what this gives you. Okay, this part was also done in, independently by Omer Panet and Rafael Pass. And in independent work, usually using kind of pretty similar techniques. Okay, uh, so first, what is the correlate for this? So, okay, so now what we know is that under, we had, as I said, we had bargs not very succinct, but well, we had, well, we had very succinct bargs under LWE and less succinct under DLIN and then under DDH and quadratic residues, but since we can boost them all the way up, then we, first we get this rate one barg, right? One witness with an additive of polylog, and we get just from, from there, I 
I should move to. I feel like I'm not a very good student here for the recordings. Uh, and we get these snarks with this polylog succinctness. Okay, so this is really a, a what we wanted. Okay, any questions before I tell you how we boost? Like, so the rest of the talk, I want to show you how we boost the succinctness of bargs. Any, any questions before we go into that? Okay, so actually, but before I show you how to boost, I want to talk about the uh, uh, corollaries, uh, which was your question, Kaden. So one of the corollaries I want to talk about is actually, but this is corollary of the rate one barg. Okay, why, why am I so excited about the single witness plus polylog? And the reason it allows us to do the updating, so the, to update the barg. So what do I mean? What happens if you have a rate one barg, what you can do is kind of barg the bargs. So what do I mean by that? Let's say I, I have a bunch of statements. I generate a barg. Call it barg one. Then I have another statement. I generate another barg, barg two, and so on and so on. So now I have all these bargs. OK, up to, let's say, barg k. Not many bargs. But what I want to actually prove that all these k squared statements are correct. Now I have k bargs. That's pretty big. <clears throat> so now note each barg is of size one witness plus some overhead. The overhead is polylog. What I can do? is I can barg these bargs. Okay, I can say now the barg is that there exists barg one up to barg k. These are the witnesses. And each barg is a witness for, you know, <clears throat> for being that x1 up to xk is in the language. So I can barg the bargs. And the overhead here is just 2o. And I can barg the bargs and the bargs and 3o. Well, I can do it polylog times and still have only polylog overhead. Okay, or I can do a D, I can have like depth D bargs, and then I'll have D times polylog overhead. Okay, and this is very powerful. So it's powerful, so what is, it allows you kind of to do this kind of multi-hop barg, or multi-hop kind of aggregations of the barg. And it, this gives you a lot of things. This gives you really interesting correlated, correlation, um, corollaries in cryptography. For example, it allows you to do aggregate signatures, which was kind of a big open problem in cryptography. But I don't want to go into too much uh, kind of heavy crypto. Let me give you one application to incrementally verifying verifiable computation. So this was a, uh, a task that was introduced by Valiant in 2008. And what is the goal of incrementally verifiable computation? The goal is the following. Let's say there's a very, very long computation, takes time t. And there's one person takes kind of the initial configuration, he does t1 steps. And then he generates a proof that, you know, t, the configuration time t1 is the correct configuration. So he generates the certificate. And he goes away. And now someone else, let's say Moni, wants to go from t1 to t2. Okay, so he can generate certificates saying t1, t2, but now we have two certificates. So okay, you can put the two certificates. And then you want to go from T2 to T3. Uh, but then you'll have too many certificates. Eventually, the, two, the certificates will be too long. So you want to kind of aggregate them kind of succinctly. So I want to argue that using our bargs, we can do it. And let me give you kind of the high level idea of how this is done. OK, we're going to take the first K configurations. So OK, so I'm starting to compute. I'm going to take the first K configurations. <clears throat> I'm going to hash it down and give a little certificate, like a barg, right, that they're all uh, 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 consistent and consistent with the input and so on. So now I know this configuration is, is correct. This, the k configuration is the right one. <clears throat> then I go from configuration k to 2k. I hash it down, I give a certificate, everything is consistent. And so on and so forth, up to k. Once I reach k, now I have too many certificates. I don't want to even, I don't want to store so many certificates. Okay, I'm going to, I'm going to hash these certificates and I'll prove that all these certificates are valid certificates. And so on and so forth. I, go, I, I can go, I, I, the, true, the tree here will be of size polylog t. So I can kind of go one by one every time. So, you know, so now I, let's say I give, I do the first two uh, certificates, I give it to Moni, Moni does another two, gives it on, and once you, the person who gets k, they're gonna batch it down. Okay, now we have the prime. The next person has the prime, does the next, uh, you know, and every time when you have two men, you're going to hash it. You're going to kind of, uh, sorry, not, like uh, aggregate them together, batch them. And so every, now the number of, of, uh, of certificates you're going to have is like the depth of the tree. You're going to have one for kind of each depth and, uh, you know, maximum, uh, you know, k that you're going to hang out onto. You can think of k as being pretty small. We, we control the k. k can be two. We can have kind of fan out two. 
So this is kind of the high level idea of how this is done. Uh, I hid, as I wrote now, it's more complicated than this. I don't want to go into the details, but for example, you need to ensure consistency. You need to ensure that the configuration K that you used here is the same configuration K used here. So what I wrote now, actually, I don't know how to analyze. I need to slightly complicate it a little bit, but this is the essence of the idea. Also, the inputs now are kind of hashed. Before, I said, oh, you seek x1 up to xk, and you can have a bar. Now the input, the input is like x0 to, to configuration k, configuration two. You don't hold these configurations anymore. You only, so you need kind of a hashed multi-hot bar kind of thing. So things are a little more complicated, but this is really the idea. Once you have this, the rest is just kind of an exercise. OK, so, so what did we, where are we now? So we said, OK, we, our goal is to boost snarg from like a pathetically long snarg all the way to rate one snarg. And I tried to convince you that rate one, uh, like, sorry, all the way to rate one barg. And I tried to convince you that rate one barg here is uh, you know, a great uh, uh, task because it gives you this incrementally verifiable computation. OK, question so far? Yes? So the question one, is it beneficial to combine things or have things? OK, uh, okay. so the question is, is there any benefit to combining the configurations? So think about, OK, the answer is yes. So think of it as fine. No one in this world can do this computation on his own. So no one can actually, or no one wants to, or it's very expensive. So no one wants to actually save all the bottom configurations. OK, I am willing to do a little bit and give you a succinct snarg. I don't want to save the configurations anymore. No one wants to. It's too expensive. And then someone does, do, was that the question? Uh, no, I just have a question. The problem with, like, is there any point in combining, let's say, like? Oh, OK. <clears throat> Sorry, you're saying, why go from 0, 1, just go from uh, configuration 0 to configuration k, to configuration 2k, or whatever. Yeah, yeah that's, that's totally fine. It's, uh, yeah, it's mainly presentation. It, yeah, it doesn't matter. Good. Sorry, I didn't understand the question. Uh, great. Uh, any other question? Was there? Yeah. OK, good. So the question is about, now I'm going to show you how I boost. So far, I just told you an uh, application of the boost. But I didn't explain yet at all how I do the boosting. Ah, ah OK, good, good, good. So your question is, well, is it easier to get? Maybe, uh, maybe it's, once you have some bar, you will get all the way down to polylog. Uh, is, it, uh, is it easier to get? Is it really easier? Of course. Uh, um, you know, semantically, it's easier to get, uh, you know, a long bar than a small bar, but is it really easier? So, the t okay, so first answer is not clear. But, you know, we had already results, like that did only t to the epsilon. We didn't know how to get it all the way down to polylog t for a while. We were stuck on that. And there's the, the result that did, uh, you know, square root k. They couldn't get it down based on DDH and quadratic residue. They were stuck. So the answer is, yeah, it seems like it's, much easier to get bigger ones. But now what you're asking is, OK, now I, I want like a pathetically large you know, bar. Will that be easy? I don't know. I, we didn't actually think about it that much. You know, this is very new from like now. So I, uh, but yeah, right, that's the next question. Maybe these bars were OK with making them so big. Maybe now it's a uh, pretty easy problem. Let me know if you come up with something. Huh? Uh, OK, uh, great. Any other questions? Okay, so uh, okay, so now I want to talk to you how I boost. Okay, so far I said boosting is great, and then we can boost. How do we boost? And the the main technique of boosting is coming up with new RAM snarks. RAM snarks is what allows us to boost, and I'll, I'll explain what. But in order to do that, we need to come up with a new definition of soundness. The definition of soundness we had before for RAM snarks, we can't use it. So we come up with a new soundness definition, a new construction, and using this RAM, we can boost. And to construct this uh, RAM snark, we also do, uh, have a new primitive, which we call a fully local summer extractable hash. I'll explain what that is. Uh, but it seems, all these seem like, uh, also this new RAM snark, it seems to be much more, to allow much more than just to boost the bar. You know, it seems like a technique that can be used 
in other places as well. So it's kind of an interesting kind of tool uh, to take around, uh, so as the fully local uh, summer extractable hash. It seems like a technique which can be useful in other places as well. Okay, so before I go and define, da -da -da -da, let me show you the construction, how we boost. Okay, and then we'll talk about what definition we need in order to boost. Okay, so, uh, okay, so let me first tell you what, <clears throat> what, is, what is a RAM snug and what was the definition. I mean, before we go to the definition, what is a RAM snarg even? Okay, so in a RAM snarg, we have a long input, x1 up to xn. Think of if it is really long. The verifier is not holding this input. It's too long to hold. He's have, he has a hash. Okay. Now what we want is given the CRS, we said, you know, we need a common random string, given the CRS, uh, and then input and the computation, we can produce the output together with the certificate that certifies the correctness. But importantly, this certificate can be verified given only the hash. So the person who verifies does not even know X. He's just given the hash. Yeah. Yeah. No. Otherwise, if the, the prover has to have the input, because uh, how can he prove? He doesn't need to run. He has RAM access to that input. He doesn't need to read the entire thing. He has RAM access, but he, otherwise he doesn't know. So he, he has to, he, he needs to do the computation. And then, yeah, so the, think of the... the yeah, exactly. The prover, there's some RAM computation. The prover only accesses what the RAM computation tells him to access, and with that he can produce the... So you're right. I don't need to give him X as input. I need to give him Oracle access to X. Yes, good. Wow, you're following. Um, great. Uh, okay, I think I have at least one, you know, uh, dedicated follower here. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> uh, okay. So, okay, so let's see. How, given that, how do we get our rate one bar? Before we define soundness and so on. The rate one bar is actually pretty easy looking at least. Here it is. So what I'm going to show you is how you take, you start with a bar that has polylog multiplicative overhead and this RAM snarg, let's say with polylogarithmic of size polylog size, and I'm going to construct this rate one bar, okay, which has size of one witness with a, a, a additive polylog overhead. Okay, so here's my bar, my rate one bar. What do I do? I first take all my witnesses, I hash them down, succinct. Then, I, what I'm going to do, I'm going to give a barg. Now, my barg has multiplicative overhead, so that's not good. But, what I barg is not the witnesses. What I'm going to barg is RAM proofs. So, what I'm going to, I'm going to hear RAM, the first proof is a proof that says that the first witness under the hash is valid. It's a valid witness of X1. The second RAM proof says that the second witness is a valid witness of X2, and so on and so forth. So what I barg is the RAM proofs. Now, the RAM proofs are succinct. They're polylog. So what I have here is really kind of, I have like the RAM proof or size poly T here, the time, going back, it's the RAM time. How much time does it take to verify that W1 is a valid witness of X1? Poly n, n being the length of x1. Or, and think of, yeah. And so the RAM is of size polylog n. The bar adds an extra polylog k multiplicative of overhead. Fine, still polylog. Think of k and n. Think of n is smaller than poly, poly k, okay? So overall polylog. Fantastic. So it seems trivial, kind of. The question is, is this sound? And the problem is that it's not even clear what RAM soundness even means is really the issue. Because RAM soundness, the, the prover generates this hash. We don't know what's underneath the hash. He may not know what's underneath the hash. He generates garbage. The hash value, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, whatever. Now, is the RAM proof correct? What do you mean correct with respect to what? With respect to the pre-image, there's no pre-image. What's the pre-image? There's many pre-images. Uh, it, it's, it's not binding. So what, what that even means is not clear. So let me kind of go over kind of what, so this is our construction. What kind of RAM, so, RAM soundness we need? Yes? Good. With trim machine, you know the input. So with a trim machine, the, the, the cheating, great question. Thank you. So the question was, what is the difference between RAM and a trim machine? And the answer is with the RAM, the adversary gives you an input, a computation, and let's say an incorrect statement. 
Here, he doesn't even, you don't, he doesn't give you the input. He gives you a hash. And then he claims this statement. What is the statement? Oh, what's underneath the hash? What's underneath the hash? Uh, can be anything. I like, there can be not anything, but many, many things. So the statement is not well defined even. Okay, so that's kind of the, it's not clear what this even means. Yes? Good, very good, wonderful. Here you go. So, I, I, okay, so the question is what's wrong with the following definition? This one. Okay, so here's the definition. You want to say the adversary cannot generate a RAM snarks for a false statement. Now, what is a false, what is a statement here first? He generates a hash. The statement is like a hash. What does the verifier see? What's the statement? A hash, a Turing machine, and an output. The output, think of it, in this case, the output is like one, right? Meaning that, uh, uh, that it's verified. Like the Turing machine just checked the ver the, uh, that, that the witness is a, ver a valid witness. So why not just say, yeah, so the statement is that there does not exist a pre-image. In this case, there does not exist a valid witness. That, that's great. And yes, that, you're right. That's a great definition. But this is like, this implies uh, snarks for NP. We don't know how to achieve this definition. So we do want to say, the best definition is say, you know what, there does not exist any pre-image. Yeah, there are many, there's exponentially many pre-image. Fine. But none of the pre-images will be a valid witness. That's what you want to say. After all, if x1 is not in the language, there does not exist a valid witness. This is also, there's not a pre-image that's valid witness. These do not exist. So let's just say, look, there does not exist any pre Yeah, there are exponentially many possibilities. None of them are going to be valid witnesses. That's what we want. That's a great definition. But this definition implies uh, snarks for NP. Why? Hash the, the hash the witness, and now give a RAM proof that the hash that's, that witness is valid. That was, that, that's going to be a snark for NP. So this is a great definition, but it seems like hard to achieve. Okay, because as I said, that's kind of our holy grail. Yes, that's what we want. We would like to get there, but we still seem like we're far. So that's too much. So what do we have? The definition that we used is to say, okay, the adversary cannot actually, yeah, the verifier verifies everything efficiently. But we want to say, if the adversary gives us the pre-image, he actually gives us the x. So in this case, he gives you the w1 of the wk. If he gives you the pre-image, he can't cheat. So he cannot give you a full pre-image and a statement of that's false. Now, now false makes sense. That it gives you a pre-image such that m of x is not y, and you, then he can't give you a certificate. So actually, all our known RAM snarks are under this definition. So yeah, we can, this is a definition, it's valid, and we have constructions, everything is good. I think it's not very useful. Because for example here, it's very nice, if the adversary knew all the pre-images, but he's not gonna give us the pre-images. You know, the adversary is not nice, he just wants to cheat. So his, what he'll do here, he'll give you some hash value, whatever, and some barb. He's not going to give you a pre-image of all the, this huge <laughs> you know, set of, pre of uh, fake uh, witnesses. So this is not a useful definition. Kid. So no, so good. So the question is, uh, uh, right, so. <clears throat> Okay, no, 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 what, no, sorry, okay, what, okay, sorry. The question is what I mean here the adversary cannot generate. Yes, so I want to say if the adversary can generate a large X and this hashed, this statement, that is, and a certificate that's false, then we can use him to break LW, to break this, to break that, yes. Great, cannot meaning computationally cannot. Great, great question, thank you. What I meant, cannot meaning computationally. Everything is, there's no information theory here, things are computational. Great, thank you. Okay, so what we do in this work is we define a new uh, soundness definition, okay, and construct. And essentially our soundness definition is actually inspired by this construction. The point is, okay, the adversary can't, he may not know all w1 up to wk, yeah, yeah he just generates a, a value. But let's make this hash extractable on one witness. That we can do because this hash can be of length one witness. So let's make it kind of uh, binding and extractable on one part. And suppose 
that the train machine only touches this part, which is what it does. The RAM proof only touches, so we have RAM proof I, it only touches witness I. So we want to say, well, if we can extract one part, one small part of the hash, and the RAM machine only touches this part, then we get Thomas. And that's exactly our new definition. So here's our new definition. We call it somewhere input soundness, which means somewhere we know the input. So we have this input to the hash. The adversary is not going to, we don't know the input, but somewhere we do. Okay, so it says the following. An adversary computationally, yeah, he cannot or it's hard to generate a statement, which is a hash of a long input, a Turing machine and an output, and a valid certificate, a valid proof, if n, let's say, only depends on a few coordinates of the input x. So x is huge, but maybe n touches only a few, like only one witness. And if h of x is local, you can extract only the coordinate in i. The coordinates in i, and, you know, and it's false, m on x sub i, well, you extract it, it doesn't give you y, then you can't forge. Okay, so we, so we get soundness if we're extractable on a small set, and the Turing machine only touches the small set. In some sense, it's a generalization of like knowing everything. We don't know everything, but we don't need to know everything. RAM, sorry. Yeah, M here, is, think of it as a RAM. Yeah, it, sorry. I use M, but I'm thinking of RAM. Thank you, uh, Moni. Yeah. yeah. Good. So, okay, for the honest input, actually, we always get completeness, okay? Even honest input, you all, you know, if he's honest, even if N touches everything and, uh, you know, nothing is extractable, you'll accept him. That's okay. But you're concerned about malicious, essentially. But, but here, for example, but, you, but the truth is it doesn't matter if honest or malicious. We'll use it only because you're worried about malicious. So we will use it only <coughs> for computations that touch a small fraction. So we'll use these RAM snarks only for computations that touch, it, that touch a fraction of the input that we, can, we know. We, either we can extract it from the, from the um, adversary or someone, it's, somehow it's known to us. This is, otherwise, the soundness, uh, yeah. Also for the previous definition of soundness, the one, um, not the one that we couldn't achieve, but the one that we could achieve, it said, oh, adversary tells you all the X. He tells you. Now he won't tell us, it's if he tells you, okay, if he won't. So here we say, well, if he tells you only a small fraction and that's the only, the computation won't depend on this. And I was saying, but he won't tell me. Oh, no, 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 I'm gonna extract it from the hash. He gives you a hash, this is extractable. So actually, I'll know this, that, that part of the input because I'm making the hash extractable on these locations, okay? So this is the definition. Uh, questions? Yeah. Good, so the quantifying says the following. Uh, no, I didn't write it down, but thanks. So the question is, what is the quantification on I? So the, it says the following. For any RAM machine, any I, and, uh, and any I, any adversary, so think, you, you, you can, for any adversary, the adversary can choose M, the RAM machine. He can choose the indices I, and he can choose the output Y. If, you know, it's false, and things are extractable on I, then he, 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 will, he will fail to produce a valid certificate. Yeah, but hash needs to be extractable on that size. So the, the hash will grow with I. It can be any size, but the hash will have to grow with I. Great, great questions. Was it always, was it always the same? Can it come to consideration? Okay, so the question was, what if the adversary has exponential time? Or, so even if, okay, even if the, the thing is the hash, is small, so there's actually <clears throat> exponentially many possibilities. In other words, the input is not well defined. It's not just a matter of hard to find the input. It's not well defined, there are many, many options. So it's not just a matter of uh, things are not well defined. What I'm doing here is I'm making the input well defined. This definition says the hash, I'm gonna make it binding on these locations. So now the input is well defined, it's binding. Okay, and I'm also I'm making it extractable. 
if I didn't make it extractable, then we'll need to play with exactly what you're saying, make things kind of work hard to kind of find it. But I'm saying, okay, with a trapdoor, I can even, I can even extract it, so I don't need to rely on kind of these sub-exponential assumptions, what we call kind of working hard to find it. Uh, but, but it's also a matter, it's not just a matter of time, it's a matter of, of defining it correctly. What does it mean soundness? So here I'm saying, no, the hash is actually binding on a set of locations. And if inside the set of locations, what's written there is false, like it doesn't satisfy, you won't be able to, to cheat. Okay, so, <clears throat> and importantly, we construct these RAM snargs, the hash grows with I, with the number of coordinates. But the RAM is of size much smaller than I. And that's really important. The fact that we can get these really succinct uh, RAM proofs uh, of size actually polylog in N, so we construct a RAM snarg where the size of the RAM snarg doesn't grow with this number I. Of course the hash does because it's statistically binding on I locations. It has to grow with I just by pigeonhole principle. And, and this hash is common to many parts. You're reusing it. In some, you know, in this application, in the map, the application I have in mind, you're not reusing it. But yes, you can think of applications that you're reusing it. Right. You have one big hash. Uh, you're going to reuse it across applications. It's going to grow with the locality of the, of the RAM machines. So let's say you have a RAM machine, you're going to use many, many RAM machines. Like think of, uh, for example, uh, the application of blockchain. Uh, well, no, that's not actually a good application. But think you have a huge memory and you want to check kind of small things in the memory. Okay? And uh, everything you check, let's say, has K bits. So the hash will be, by, will be of size K, and then all the hashes are going to be of size polylog. That's kind of the way to think about it. Um, Okay, so I, I won't have time to tell you how we construct this RAM, but we can construct it actually from BARG. Okay, so we show how to go from BARG to RAM. It's very easy, it's very similar to the D time T, how you go from RAM to D time T. You can also go from D to this RAM. Uh, and, but you, he, this is where, to do this, we need this fully local, this primitive, a fully local uh, hash. Uh, and interesting, we can go back. Actually, it turns out, that this BARG and RAM snarg are kind of equivalent. Okay. So, and again, the, similar to D time T, the sizes of the RAM snarg versus the BARG is kind of, when you go from one to the other, it grows with the same kind of function. So if the BARG grows with polylog K, this will be a size polylog T, K to the epsilon, will correspond to T to the epsilon, and so on. Okay. So uh, I have, uh, like, is it until 11, right, it says, or no? Yeah? Okay, so uh, let me say a few words about how, how do I construct, so the rate one bar is exactly what I said, it's the same construction, okay? I, I'm gonna, so uh, this is my construction. The only difference is that I'm assuming that the, ra the RAM snarg has my soundness guarantee. And so f to get rate one, I need the hash to be rate one. I want it to be binding on one witness and I want it to be of size one witness plus polylog, and we can get this kind of, we construct this. Uh, I, I won't have time to show you, but we, we can do this. And now, if, if once we have this hash of size of rate one, the RAM snarg, as I said, it's polylog size. So this is gonna be polylog. The BARG has multiplicative polylog overhead, and we're done. So really, the only thing I didn't explain to you is, well, we didn't talk about how to do, the, how to actually construct this RAM, it's very, very similar to how to go from BARG to D time T. Now you need to go to RAM. That part is very similar. I didn't show you how to go from, uh, how to construct this rate one hash. So that requires a little more work, but if you, th th but other, that's kind of the missing parts. Other than that, now kind of the soundness is pretty easy. And the way, the reason is in, in, intuitively, how do we argue soundness? We want to say, suppose XI is not in the language. Let me be binding on WI. What's sitting there is fake. So let me be extractable on WI. Let me be extractable on the ith element of the BARG, on the ith witness of the BARG, which is RAM. And now guess what? I got a fake certificate for an incorrect thing, and, and, and that contradicts. Yes? Okay, you really amaze me right now. Uh, yes, so I'm, I'm shocked. Uh, yes, so there's a lot, okay, so let me say, there's a lot of technicalities and kind of hiding a little bit under the rug because there's a, a lot of details here. 
but the soundness. So the, I'll, uh, instead of repeating the question, I'll just say what, uh, what we get that I didn't say, and you notice. The soundness condition that the barg has, all our barg, bargs have the following soundness condition. That an adversary cannot first tell you where he's cheating. He cannot, so in other words, for any fixed i, he cannot generate x1 up to xi, up to xk, so that xi is false and with a standard proof. So this is exactly what, you, what, what your question was. So I didn't even define what barg soundness is actually in this talk, because I'm, I, but the definition. Okay, that's enough to get D time, that's enough, yeah, that's enough to get snargs, for example, yes, yes. Yeah, it's, it seems enough for use cases, yes. Uh, for the use cases I, I explained, yes. Uh, but uh, great. Okay, any, <clears throat> any questions about... Uh... Okay, so let me maybe say a few words about... Now, so I showed you if I had polylog K bar, I can go all the way to rate one. But now let me tell you how I go from a pathetic bar to polylog. And you know the funny thing? It's very similar. Actually, I, you know, these are two independent papers with different set of authors, but when, we didn't re realize how similar the techniques were when we wrote the papers, and now they're getting combined to a nice journal version together. But really, it's amazing how, how similar they are. So I'm going to go from pathetic bark to polylog, and that's what we need for the SNARG, not for the rate one, but for the SNARG application. And so here, for example, we know how to do this, for example, from d -lean or eh, whatever assumptions, now we get, uh, you know, for the SNARG. Okay. What, what, what's the bark? Eh? Same. Same bark. Now, not quite, because, okay, you know, it's sound if we use the some partial, the, sorry, I wrote partial, yeah, the uh, partial input sound somewhere in, in I think some place I called it somewhere input soundness as opposed to partial input soundness. I mean the same thing. So it's sound, but this is not good because this barg is still very long because, so we need to be extractable, but this barg, the barg we have, is very long. It's of size k to the one minus epsilon. So succinct, the efficiency gain or the succinctness doesn't work. It's not good succinctness. Okay, but I'm going to make it succinct. How? Using some recursion. So here's the idea. I'm going to use this trick from the Chuduri et al. paper. It's like a very, very simple two-to-one trick. It's really nice. What is the trick? Look, I have your K statements, which are K, RAM, K, uh, K witnesses, right? RAM1, RAM proof 1, 2 up to K. But actually, I, I want to think of them as K over 2 statements, K over 2 witnesses. <clears throat> the first witness are the four, first two RAM proofs. Second, the next two. The next, I'm going to pair them. Now, as long as each pair is of size smaller than one witness, I have k over 2 with the size of one witness. So as long as each RAM proof is of size witness over 2, a pathetically long RAM, I'm OK. Now, this, the, the RAM snarg I get here is indeed pathetic. Because remember I told you I construct a RAM snarg from a barg. The barg gives me the RAM snarg. If this length is pathetic, this length is pathetic. So the RAM snarg has very long, but as long as it's of length at, at most one witness over two, so I'm not even talking, it's, it's, you know, I'm not even talking about t to the one minus epsilon, no, no, t over two, over two, like really minor, minor improvement. Then I can batch them together. And then I'm going to use kind of a barg on k over two witnesses. So in other words, my barg is going to be, let's hash them. Now instead of thinking of them as k, let me hash these and think of the first two as witness, the second two as witness, and so on. And I'm going to have a barg that proves the first two, that the first two rams are OK, the second two rams are OK, the third two rams are OK, and so on and so forth. And then I can recurse. Instead of giving these pies, I'm going to give the hash and do k over 4 uh, until I get to polylog. So that's the idea. Yes? Yeah, so no, I don't need to hash each thing again. Yeah, exactly. Hash of W of WK. Hash of these RAM. Hash of these RAMs. I'm going to compute a RAM on these. I'm going to hash them. I'm going to go around, around. So I'm going to hash. Exactly. I'm going to have many. I'm going to have log hashes. And the final, I'm going to have one barg. Yeah. 
Okay, so let me wrap up. <clears throat> I'm not going to show how to construct a RAM snark, but it's really similar. Uh, I'm not going to talk about fully local. I'm gonna, just going to summarize. So just kind of a quick summary of where we were. So we defined this notion of the somewhere input soundness uh, for RAM snargs. Uh, <clears throat> we construct, okay, this is something I didn't show in the talk because I didn't have time, but we can construct these RAM snargs uh, and we can use them to boost succinctness of bargs from like pathetically long bargs all the way down to rate one bargs. Uh, these are kind of these two results that I showed and uh, kind of we showed uh, two corollaries. One is for uh, SNARGs for D time T, uh, for RAM or for NTISP, and the other is for incrementally uh, verifi verifiable computation. One kind of open problem that I think is really interesting and for the cryptographers here in the audience, you know, I uh, would love to work on this. I am working on this, <laughs> but it would be great if you too, if you work on this too, is can we use this new RAM SNARG to actually help us to get the holy grail, which is delegated SNARGs for NP? So that's still kind of on my mind a lot. Okay, thank you very much. Moni, do you have? Uh, two questions uh, about implementation. The first, uh, does uh, this work imply anything about uh, Okay, so the question was, does this work? Yeah, 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 great question. So the work, uh, the question Moni asked was, does this work imply anything on statistical proofs as opposed to arguments? I don't know, that's a great question. I, look, the RAM is really computational, but it doesn't, I don't know, uh, it's something that I, you know, or in other words, can you do a similar boosting for, for proofs? It's kind of the, the question. It's a, yeah, 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 exactly, I don't know. I, why not, you know, but I don't know how to do this. This is a great kind of thing, you know, when we do things for the computational setting, it, it's begging to ask, can you do this for, in the statistical setting? Uh, or vice versa. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I don't know. The second one, does the ICP... Uh, IVC. I, you I, permuted. I, incremental verifiable computation work, uh, or does it imply uh, something like arguments? Okay, so the question was, does the IVC result imply uh, PPAD hardness? Um, no, okay. Sorts of ways, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, the, the way what I did here, it doesn't because uh, the way I did this IVC is using bargs and these bargs are not unique. To get PPAD hardness, you need a uniqueness property for PPAD hardness. You need, you need updatable proofs that are also unique and these bargs don't give you uniqueness. So, yeah. Uh, but great, great. Uh, yeah. Any any other questions? I'm allowed to ask if it's it's not my job, but I'll. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.